Good morning and welcome to The Word this morning. We're so pleased to have you joining us for our online Sunday message. And just want to encourage you that there's a place for us here in God's house, a place for you today. And wherever we're watching, wherever we're sitting under the word, God has got something for you and me to receive into our lives this morning. So are we ready? Well, today uh, we're continuing with our current series at ECC, uh, God is Love. And over the next few months, we're going to be looking at the cultural pillars of the house here. Um, and you might think, well, what is that? Um, but here at ECC, we've got four cultural pillars that we um, want to build that culture into our people, into our congregation, into everything that we do. And those um, four cultural pillars are love, relationship, honour and generosity. And last week I, I brought this great definition of what a pillar is and it's a firm upright support for a superstructure. And I was so struck by that, that you and me were pillars in the kingdom, we're pillars that are, uh, are working with God to build the superstructure of heaven here on earth. And when we don't stand or we're not where we should be, that superstructure becomes so much weaker. And today we're going to be thinking about God is love. So why is understanding his love essential for our walk? Um, and I, I came back to that scripture from last week, 1 John 4 verse 8, and it describes one of God's primary attributes as love. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. We're going to have another look at that scripture right now and it's 1 John 4 and I'm reading verse 7 to 10 and then a quick look at verse 21. So it says this, those who are loved by God let his love continually pour from you to one another because God is love. Everyone who loves is fathered by God and experiences an intimate knowledge of him. The one who doesn't love has yet to know God, for God is love. The light of God's love shined within us when he sent his matchless son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins and verse 21 says this for he has given us this command whoever loves God must also demonstrate love to others so that's you and I guys we need to demonstrate love to others just like Jesus did and I said this last week this chapter doesn't define God as love it describes God's love as permeating his essence his very self in all he is and all he does and per, when, when something permeates it's it's it seeps through it's not like a flood it's like a continual moving and seeping into and um aw tozer said tozer said this nothing god ever does or did or ever will do is separate from the love of god Everything he's ever done has been out of his love for us. And when we think of love, I don't know about you, but what do we think of? Just, just take a moment right now, maybe write it down to think about what is love? What does love look like to you? What does, what does that conjure up in our mind when we hear the word love? And, you know, maybe where we misunderstand the love of God is that love has been taken totally out of context. You know, when we see love in the movie, movies, it becomes uh, romanticised, almost put on a pedestal. If we can just attain that sort of love, then we've made it. But the love we're talking about here is, uh, is agape love. So what does that mean? Well, agape love involves faithfulness. Uh, commitment and an act of the will. It is distinguished from the other types of love by its strong character. And so, um, yeah, agape love is so beautifully described in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 7. And it says this, love is large and incredibly patient. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. 
It refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect nor selfishly seek its own honour. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offence. Love joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. Love is a safe place of shelter for it never stops believing the best for others. Love never takes failure as defeat for it never gives up. And the message version says it like this. So no matter what I say, and what I believe and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for itself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. It doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others, isn't always me first. It doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of sins of others. It doesn't revel when others grovel. It takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best and never looks back, but keeps going to the end. And um, agape love is almost always used to describe the love that it is, that is of and from God, whose very nature is love itself. And we just read that, didn't we, in 1 John 4 verse 8, God is love. God does not merely love, he is love itself. Everything God does flows from his love. That's amazing, isn't it? The type of love that characterises God is it's not a soppy, sentimental feeling as we often hear portrayed, but God it, God's love because God God loves, sorry, because that is his actual nature and the expression of his being. It's about it's what he is about. He loves the unlovable and the unlovely, not because we deserve to be loved or because any, um, because of any excellence that we possess, but because it is his nature to love and he must be true to his nature. And agape love is always shown by what it does. Wow. God's love is displayed most clearly at the cross. And in John 3, 16 and 17, it says this, For here is the way God loved the world. He gave his unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experiencing everlasting life. God did not send his, his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its saviour and rescue it. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, guys, we did not deserve such a sacrifice, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And we read that in Romans 5. God's agape love is unmerited, gracious and constantly seeking the benefit of the ones that he loves. God's demonstration of agape love led to the sacrifice of his son for those he loves. We are to love others, my friends, with that same agape love. Agape love, as modelled by Christ, is not based on feeling, but rather it is determined, it is a determined act of the will. It's a choice, a resolve to put the welfare of others above our own. That love, that agape love, can only come from its source, because of God's love towards us, we are able to love one another that way. And I found this um, description of agape love and I loved it. So agape love is not a feeling. It's a motivation for action. Love's active, isn't it? That we are free to choose or reject. Agape is a sacrificial love that voluntarily suffers inconvenience. Wow voluntarily suffers discomfort and even death for the benefit of another. And here's the crux of it. Without expecting anything in return. That's what Jesus did on the cross, isn't it? And I don't know about you, but when I read that, it kind of went, Ooh, wow. I'm going to read it again. Agape love is not a feeling, it's a motivation for action that we are free to choose or reject. 
Agape love is a sacrificial love that voluntarily suffers, voluntarily suffers inconvenience, discomfort and even death for the benefit of another without expecting anything in return. And I've been rereading the Joyce and Mayer book, The Love Revolution, and I'm telling you, it's challenging. And understanding agape love for us is, essential, is essential if we're going to understand how God is calling us to live and to love. Not because we can, but because he does through us as we give our lives over to him. Oh, giving our all is challenging, my friend. It stretches our faith to a whole new level. But it also brings freedom of knowing nothing in the world has a hold on us. After all, all things are possible for those who believe. If he has said it, he will be faithful to it. So where in scripture is a great example of this other than Jesus? Well, this reminded me of the story of the Good Samaritan. And you find that in Luke 10. <coughs> and this morning we're going to start at verse 25. And the title in, uh, in the Passion Translation for this was Loving God, Loving Others. Just then a religious scholar stood before Jesus in order to test his doctrines. He posed this question. Teacher, what requirements must I fulfil if I want to live forever? In heaven and Jesus replied what do you read in the law how do you understand it the religious scholar answered it states you must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your passion all your energy and your every thought and you must love your neighbor as yourself Jesus said that is correct now go and do exactly that and you will live Wanting to justify himself, he questioned Jesus further. But what do you mean by my neighbour? Jesus replied. There, once was a, there was once a Jewish man travelling from Jerusalem to Jericho when bandits robbed him along the way. They beat him severely, stripped him naked and left him half dead. Soon, a Jewish priest walking down the road came upon the wounded man. Seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed to the other side of the road and walked right past him, not turning to help him one bit. Later, a religious man, a Levite this time, came walking down the same road and likewise crossed to the other side to pass by the wounded man without stopping to help him. Finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. He stooped down and gave him first aid, pouring olive oil on his wounds, disinfecting them with wine and bandaging them to stop the bleeding. Lifting him up, he placed him on his own donkey and brought him to an inn. Then he took him from his donkey and carried him to a room for the night. The next morning, he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper with these words. Take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, I will repay you when I return. So now, tell me, which one of the three men who saw the wounded man proved to be the true neighbour? The religious scholar responded, the one who demonstrated kindness and mercy. Jesus said, go and do the same as he. And Jesus gave the parable of the Good Samaritan as an example of sacrifice for the sake of others. That's agape love. We've just read that, haven't we? even for those who may uh, care nothing for us at all. And I love this parable. I love how God brings such revelation of agape love through this. Not only that the Samaritan and the Jewish man would have had no love lost between them, but here we see a heart of compassion move to action. You know, love, agape love moves our hearts to compassion. They move, it's moved to action. And you know, love doesn't discriminate, it doesn't judge, and it doesn't differentiate. That's how God calls us to live. It's interesting here, isn't it, that the religious man chose to do nothing. You know, guys, we must be a people who refuse to do nothing. Even if what we can do is small, we must find a way to do something when it comes to meeting the needs that God makes us aware of. 
maybe that's buying something for the food bank maybe that's helping a neighbor there must be so way, many ways of us to help right now in our nation where people are struggling to pay their bills to feed their children to heat their homes not that we need to heat it in a heat wave and no one um <clears throat> you know no one looks at the quantity of what you do but god sees the heart and the heart of compassion that he places in us to love like he loves and maybe that might be a word of encouragement or an offer to pray for somebody agape love never assumes that we can't but it looks at ways that we can you know agape love doesn't find an excuse for why not because it can't be bothered or think somebody else will if i don't agape love moves us to action remember agape love is not a feeling it's a motivation for action that we are free to choose or reject. God's a gentleman. Agape love is a sacrificial love that voluntarily suffers inconvenience, discomfort and even death for the benefit of others without expecting anything in return. We can because he did, he did and he still does. So what else can we draw from this parable? Well, the Samaritan went to a lot of trouble to help this man. He certainly walked the extra mile, didn't he? Um, and he certainly did that in excellence. He wasn't half-hearted in that approach. Uh, you know, he must have delayed his journey. He was obviously going somewhere and needed to be there as he left the injured man long enough to take care of his business before he, before he returned to settle the bill. He didn't just drop him off and, and pay some of it and then go on with his journey and forget about him. He got on with his journey and then he came back and settled the bill. Wow, that is awesome, isn't it? He invested his time, his money, and was willing to be inconvenienced in order to take care of someone in need. Wow, not just somebody in need, but a Jewish man in need. And he, remember, was a Samaritan. That, my friends, is agape love in action and I have to ask myself and I have been asking myself this week am I willing to be inconvenienced in order to take care of someone else's needs that's been a big challenge for me he acted with a heart of generosity not out of fear for what it would cost him but out of a heart that was um, filled with compassion for this guy and I love how through scripture, I'm sorry about that as I'm recording, the printer is going, so I do apologise. But I love how through scripture that Jesus shows us through parables and what Jesus did, that love must be more than a theory. It must be more than a word or a feeling. It has to be, it has to be, it has to be an action. When did we last make a cuppa for someone? Just because we can. When did we last pick up the phone and have a chat with someone? Because we can. When did we last uh, meet somebody's needs? Because we can. Whether that's financially or physically or emotionally or spiritually. You know, God is love. Love is and has been and will continue to be his idea. Because it's who he is. And if it's who he is, it's who we are and who we should be. He came to love us, to teach us and to show us how to love him and to teach us how to love ourselves and to teach us and show us how to love others. And when we do this, my friend's life is beautiful. It's fulfilling. And you know what? We see everyday miracles of a loving, amazing, fabulous, generous God who wouldn't want a life like that who wouldn't want to live life like that wow living an extraordinary life every day because of who he is and today my friends we can step into that we can step over the line you know Joyce Mayer in the love revolution encourages readers to take up this motto for their lives and uh, it says this I take up compassion and surrender my excuses. Oh, I need to do that. I stand against injustice and commit to live out simple acts of God's 
love. I love that. Simple acts of God's love. No one's asking us to change the world, but step by step, person by person, simple acts of God's love. It's going to strengthen the pillar of love in our lives and in the life of the church and the bride of Christ. It's going to impact people's lives. You know, the word says, they'll know who I am by the way that you love, by the way that you love one another, by the way that you love him. And then it fin it finishes with this. I refuse to do nothing. This is my resolve. I am the love revolution. I am, you are, we are the ones that are the love revolution by the power of the spirit at work in and through our lives. Because he is love, we can be the love revolution that this nation, this world, this village, this county needs. And today, I encourage you to take action. This week, I encourage you to take action. Don't make excuses for why not, but look for reasons why. Not because of who you are, but because of who he is in and through you. Remember, he's our provider. Whatever we do, he's going to make sure that we don't uh, go without. He is a generous God, and as we're generous, he's going to pour his generosity into our lives, his provision into our lives as we step into those new things. So yeah, Father God, oh, thank you that you want to change our perspective of love. Thank you, God, you want us to stop making the excuses for why not and start looking for the reasons why. Thank you, God, you're calling us to lavish love on other people so that they can see the love of a father through our lives. Thank you, God, you're calling us to be the love revolution. Thank you, Jesus. Pray that today, as we make that commitment to you, that we're going to, this week, we're going to surrender our excuses. This week, we're going to look for reasons why and why not. This week, we're going to see the mir see miracles in everyday situations. Thank you, God, that you are at work. Amen. I encourage you to, um, yeah, to look for, for ways to lavish love on people this week. That might be making uh, somebody a cup of tea and having a chat with them and making some space for them. It might be praying for them or a word of encouragement. Whatever that is, don't delay. Because God wants to build something in and through you. Amen. Thanks for joining us uh, for our service today. And we pray that this week you will know the agape love of Jesus and that you will allow his Holy Spirit to cause you to be stirred into action. Amen. See you next week, guys. Bye.